Be Rad podcast is brought to you by MoFo, male optimization formula with organs to boost testosterone. Brad's macadamia masterpiece, mind-blowing nut butter blend, now offered on Amazon. Chili technology, temperature-controlled mattress systems for a good night's sleep. InsideTracker.com, offering blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data all in one place and Organifi, whole food organic superfood supplements and drink blends. And please visit the shopping page at bradkearns.com for my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance with great discounts for listeners. Here we go with the show. You have to to really ask yourself hard questions or hire a coach that that will help you ask yourself those questions so that you can understand uh, yourself in a deeper level and make the positive adjustments. Maybe it's just taking more vacation. Maybe it's dialing in your sleep. Maybe it's writing that book that you told yourself that you were going to write 10 years ago and you haven't even started. Instead of saying, I should work out today, you can reframe that. And this is another you know, NLP technique is to reframe that into a statement, which is, it's important for me to work out today. Even that subtle shift, that change in language, gives you um, agency and responsibility over what you're going to choose to do during that day. And then it becomes not this thing that that you are beholden to because somebody's going to, you know, if you don't do it, you're going to get in trouble, but rather you're reorienting the way that you decide to live your life. Your subconscious mind is telling you you're not good enough or this will never work or, you know, don't take a risk. You know, you need that job because you need the insurance and all these things, these narratives, they just they get bog us down and working with a with a really skilled life coach that can help you identify those and then either reframe those or purge those through you know some other sorts of practices to, that I really like. Hey listeners, we're going to talk to a very interesting, optimal performer in life by the name of Sean McCormick. He hosts the very interesting Optimal Performance Podcast. He's also a life coach. He's an expert in plant medicine, and he's all about peak performance, biohacking, living life on the edge. And I especially love his approach to coaching. Uh, if you go to his website, you'll read the most thoughtful and well-worded uh, coaching presentation that really captivates you. And as we get into some of the methods that he uses for personal coaching, you're going to be really fascinated. He'll have some really awesome takeaways tips for free just for listening to the show. Maybe it'll compel you to want to hire this guy to work with you one-on-one personally because he really has some amazing things going on. Uh, let me just read you a little bit of his uh, coaching presentation. It'll stop you in your tracks if you're surfing the internet and browsing things quickly. He says, good coaches are masters at getting the best out of you, but it doesn't stop there. Performance coaches also help you find effective ways to keep you accountable to your highest self. Your true calling, your highest level of love and happiness, your best self are inside you. And how does the coach help you get there? Through penetrating questions, through challenging you on your terms, through identifying words, habits, nonverbal cues, and trends that you don't even know are limiting you through tools, exercises, and techniques that have proven effectiveness, and through suggested work between sessions that will build new habits and move momentum in your favor. Oh, man. And so uh, as we go through the show, he talks about the four different uh, modalities that he coaches to. Uh, one of them is classic personal development, you know, getting your daily schedule optimized. We have a nice uh, conversation near the end uh, about being more efficient with email, which was so interesting to me. I raised my hand and volunteered to be the guinea pig there because I still struggle with the distraction. He said email is one of the number one distractions. Uh, on the planet for your productivity and your daily existence because it's other people uh, dumping their shit into your life. What a great description there. Uh, so he talks about batching. He talks about uh, kind of prioritizing or segmenting emails based on the ability to reply and how long it's going to take. Really, really helpful to me. Uh, so anyway, there's classic personal development that he coaches to, uh, biohacking, things that are in and around and inside you. I guess that would mean uh, food, uh, your 
your environment, uh, you know, optimizing your home. He's talking about switching from LED lights to incandescent lights, a very fascinating conversation about the negative effects of uh, blue light, artificial light, especially after dark. Um, his third area of coaching is professional development. And then finally, spiritual development. And the starting point are these eight categories to evaluate how things are going in your life. And uh, it's going to be really interesting just to listen to him uh, narrate the eight categories and give you a quick consideration of how various things are uh, juggling and uh, working together well, or maybe how some like a dogged pursuit of uh, material success in the workplace is compromising other areas of your life. Uh, but his specialty really is helping you uh, destroy and reframe self-limiting beliefs and he talks about Bruce Lipton and how we're operating from flawed subconscious programming 93 to 98% of the time. He clarifies that so you can really understand what that insight is all about. And then he gives you step by step in this show a way in which to interrupt these negative patterns that have harmed your life with a method he calls the stop method, a four stage method to overcome self limiting beliefs or behavior patterns, such as getting triggered and stuck in anger or fear or anxiety. You're going to absolutely love this show. And here we go with Sean McCormick, host of the Optimal Performance Podcast. Sean McCormick, the optimal performance man of the planet. I am so happy you could join us. And we got all kinds of things to talk about because we've been burning up the email exchanges. Yeah, yeah. It's so I'm so happy to be here. After, you know, I just released, at the day that we're recording this, I just released my episode with you. And in the post-production process, it is so packed with so much great information. I People are going to get so much from it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, having me on your podcast. This is rad. Well, let's hear about the Optimal Performance Podcast so we can plug my show. The listeners can go over there and listen to that. But then as you scroll through the guests and the content, um, it's pretty optimal, man. It's pre You're pretty out there. I, I got to say, you're, you're really pushing the edges in, in so many different directions. We're going to get into your life coaching and the things that you do to help others. But uh, give, us, give us a rundown of uh, what it's like hosting that podcast and some of the highlights of Th you know, favorite guests and uh, the journey that's been for you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, and, and any opportunity to plug to plug the podcast is is uh, uh, comes with great gratitude. You know, I I really just I follow breadcrumbs. The stuff that is interesting to me is the stuff that I go seek out. And in pod podcast land, sometimes you're uh, your pitched guests from uh, book publishers. Sometimes you are pitch guests from PR companies. So sometimes I have people coming in to me that, that, uh, you know, uh, cellular health or, you know, the communication of, of cells between each other, um, that falls in my bucket. I'm fascinated by that. And so I, I, I roll with it. Uh, and other things, you know, uh, that, that I'm just really fascinated by. So looking over the back, the past, a number of episodes. Uh, I did an episode on running with uh, the host of another podcast called Brody Sharp. It's called Run Smarter. Uh, before that, I did a two-part episode with a fellow named Steve Rio, who is a fascinating guy. We talk about uh, his platform called Nature of Work, which talks about how to really structure your working from home environment, um, bookending the days, starting it the same way, ending it the same way. Um, that was the first half of the episode. The second half of the episode was de dedicated completely to the power, the most powerful hallucinogen on the planet, which is, um, five MEO DMT, why we should care about it, why we should be interested in it. So, you know, I've had Rob Wolf on the podcast. I've had, um, you know, Sean Baker from, uh, uh, you know, the carnivore movement. I had a, episode about weighted blankets have you have you ever tried a weighted blanket brad uh I've just generally i think i gave my daughter one as a gift and you know gave it a gave it a test run and read some of the some of the benefits about i guess the uh the, there's material inside that's magnetic or uh, something to do with helping your cellular flow or something the this this is specifically a quilted blanket that has glass microbeads in mm -hmm. it that creates a weight which uh, acts like um um, uh, deep pressure touch to relax you quickly. And I was super interested in it. I had read about it a little bit. And then I did an episode with, uh, Elizabeth Grosjean, who uh, was the founder of a company called Baloo. 
and it is incredible. I need to buy like five more of them because everybody in my family loves them so much. So I, you know, I'm, I'm constantly looking for ways to get the most from the least. So if that's how you structure your work day at home, cool. If that's, um, you know, responsible use of psychedelics to reach um, a greater state of consciousness, then I'm into it. You know, breath work, um, sleep health. Um, you know, you mentioned the X3 bar uh, on your episode, uh, your appearance on, on the, uh, the Optimal Performance Podcast. And I've been using that for two years. And it's basically all I do now because it gives you the biggest effect for the time, you know, 10 minute, 10 minute exercise, uh, like totally works you out. So all of these different ways, ways of thought, um, devices, um, personal performance, um, frameworks, ways of thinking about the self, you know, uh, I'm, I'm interested in all of it. And we're at such an exciting time in the, in the world where we know so much, like we can get, we, we can get, the data done to support these, these ideas um, of like really wholesome, like natural biohacking. And so that's, that's really what I focus on. And it is amazing because I've been able to speak to people that I've been admired that I've admired for a long, long time. Dude, it's awesome. I love being a podcaster. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the greatest uh, joy is the opportunity to connect with these people. And I tell my listeners, you know, one of my favorite shows was with uh, Dr. John Gray, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. I think you had him on and we discussed, uh, I listened to your show and he gave like entirely different insights and, and fresh stuff that he never mentioned on, on three of my, I had interviews with him three times. And the guy is just like the greatest bundle of energy force on the planet. But I remember our very first show, uh, you know, and we're, we're in the Zoom scene, so you know, we weren't face to face, which is even uh, more rich of an experience. But, you know, at least we were looking at each other on the screen. And at one point uh, during the interview, you know, he kind of he kind of cracked a little bit. He broke down, which is so rare for him. Right. He's a mm. he's a motor mouth. But, you know, he was talking about losing his partner of uh, 33 years, Bonnie, who's featured in all the books and, uh, you know, was right alongside him through this wonderful journey of helping people optimize their relationships. And it was a really touching moment for me because, you know, here's this guy spewing his story. He's got so much energy and excitement. And then, you know, he's dealing with this loss. And it was, I think, a year or more after the loss. And he was saying like, hey, man, ask me another question. I got to keep going. I'm trying to move past it. And, uh, mm. you know, I was compelled the very next day to propose to my girl, Mia Moore, because I'm like, he's describing oh. ideal partner here during our show. And I'm like, she's sitting right here. What am I waiting for? Life is so oh. short. And, and so I just kind of had this burst of energy and inspiration, thanks to John Gray. And awesome. I know you've probably had so many of those on, on so many different levels with your guests, but yeah, it's pretty it's pretty fantastic. And I hope the listeners are... Uh, right alongside, you know, what we're doing our best. We're working hard to, to share that information, like you say. Yeah. And, and what you're speaking out too is, is a level of humanity that we are missing. You know, we're missing campfire conversations and, um, you know, coffee, afternoon coffees that last four hours, you know, that, that level mm. of connection we just don't have. And my favorite podcasts are the ones that are, open and honest and vulnerable. And, um, and in that way, you feel like you're in on the conversation, you know, uh, how many episodes of podcasts do I listen to where I just feel like I'm in the room with those people, you know, that if they're stumbling to think of this one thing, I'm always, I, you know, you always remember the thing that they forget, you know, like who was that one actress from that one show? It's like, Oh no, I know. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I mean, the transformation can happen in such a short period of time. And when you have an opportunity to, to get downloads from truly inspirational, super wise people who have been there before and have experimented and have something really important to share, um, to, for us to be able to host podcasts where a, just a little, just a little nugget of wisdom can, in, like in your case, you know, strive, uh, elicit some action that changes your trajectory of your life. You know, if it's, if it's, um, relationship wise, or it's a, it's a new way of eating or, or a new way of exercising or something that will help you really take care of your sleep. 
like just that little spark can totally change lives. And I take it really seriously. And it's, and it's, you know, just as well as I do, it's a lot of heavy lifting, man. I mean, to be able to, to come into, to bring it every single episode, to, to ask great questions, to have great conversations, but it's, it's when I get feedback from listeners that are like, Hey, this was amazing. It's just like, Oh, okay. I can keep going. I can keep going. You feel the same way. Oh, sure. Yeah. You got to bring it every episode. It reminds me of a comment um, Seth Godin made in one of his newsletters. You know, he's the marketing guru and yeah. performance optimization guy. And he says, you know, we use this word authentic all the time. Like, I want to be the most authentic and and honest podcaster I can. He goes, we're not really authentic because we're performing and mm-hmm. we're interacting with the public. And in almost every uh, interaction you go through throughout the day, It's not truly authentic because if you had a crappy morning before we got on the air to record this podcast, I'm not seeing any of it, nor are the listeners or the viewers on YouTube because you're, you're having to bring it. And so Mm -hmm. he kind of like repositioned the concept to, uh, you know, be sort of uh, honest, vulnerable, all those other things. But we, we do know that we're putting on a show and we're trying to maximize the impact for the listener. And that means that we're not going to hear about, uh, Sean's inner interaction with the grocery store where someone cut in front of him and he was all frustrated and, and ran seven minutes late because we don't care. It doesn't, doesn't help us. So I, I like that distinction. And I think about that a lot because, uh, you know, sometimes you hear people kind of, I guess, overdo it in a way. And, uh, you know, you can get too drawn into drama rather than, um, hey, you know, I have a limited attention and time. What are you going to give me that's of the best value? Yeah. Yeah. That's an excellent um, way to think about it. I, I, you're right. It is, it is a performance and, and it's, it's coming from an act of service, which um, inherently suggests that you're giving of yourself, that you're, even if you're tired, even if you're cranky, even if you've had a, a, a bad day leading up to this, the fact that you're stepping up to the plate and giving of yourself, um, that gives for me, just gives, it gives me the juice. And, and I try, I, I really try to live as transparently as possible. And I've had, um, you know, it's this, this year, you know, some of the episodes that I've done, um, uh, on topics that are very controversial have, um, have been challenging for some of the people closest to me, you know, friends and family that, that don't like some of the stuff that I'm talking about. (laughs) And and yet I, I feel compelled to share it because it is uh, because conversation is what moves the needle. Like, this um, suppression of ideas just doesn't, this cancel culture stuff just doesn't help anybody. Cause we have to, we have to talk our way through it. We have to, we have to be able to verbalize, to disagree and to continue moving, moving forward. And so, so for me, that, that level of that level of truth, maybe not authenticity, but that level of truth, I try to bring into every single interaction I have. Yeah. Well said. And I think, um, this is what's great about being alive today. One of the first examples that comes to my mind uh, is the great uh, decathlete Bruce Jenner, who was my hero when I was a kid. And now uh, she's Caitlyn Jenner. And to think like, it, it just, it's just so mind blowing that uh, this, this picture of masculinity and athletic excellence lived his whole life in that pain and suffering and struggle, and then had the courage to come out and do uh, what she did in the public forum and, and talk to Oprah or, or whoever the, the, the groundbreaking interviews were. And to think about how many people that whole story has touched in such an amazing way. Um, counting me, who was inspired by his ability to pole vault, high jump, throw the discus, uh, <laughs> and be on the Wheaties box. But, uh, you know, whatever, 50 years ago, or I mean, how long ago was it that he won? He, almost 50 years ago. Um, you know, that all we saw was that tiny glimpse, that tip of the iceberg of the guy who was an amazing athlete. And so, especially with podcasts, what you're describing is like, we're getting past the six minute book interview on Good Morning America, where Brad Kern comes on and says, yeah, you eat less food and you make really good choices and it's really healthy. And you also have to exercise. Okay, we'll be right back after the commercial. Uh, And so no, you and I got to got to further talking about our new book and uh, all the other all the other great shows. I was uh, wanting to ask you like, you know, there's so much content out there. Where the, the ball is moving so quickly, 
uh, we're exchanging information so quickly. We're bombarded every single day with the opportunity to uh, optimize and future, further optimize after we optimize. And I wonder if you ever uh, have an experience of kind of uh, burnout or frustration that were overloaded uh, in these uh, ideas. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, this that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, when uh, for you know for your listeners who I assume are are proactive, health focused, and want to do a good job in their life, they want to they want to they want to live a high quality of life and give it their best. Um, there are lots of opportunities to become inundated with with options um, options of supplements, options of workout, options of nutrition. Um, and it's, it, it can, it can definitely become overwhelming. And especially, I mean, we're talking about like the West coast of the United States of America is probably the, the, you know, the epitome of the, of the go, 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 go sort of like go get our lifestyle. Um, and, you know, that's when I begin to think about like purpose and mission because, um, is it for a show? Is it for attention? Is it for, uh, um, um, you know, achievement? That's great. Um, but how far, what is it, what goes beyond that? Right. When, when you, uh, have either put a lot of pressure on yourself or you have a lot of pressure on you by teammates or coaches or, or coworkers or bosses to perform at a high level, it's really important to like anchor it to your why. Like, what is this all for? Why are you, why are you working so damn hard, man? Like, why don't you, why don't you slow down and chill out? And, you know, it kind of gets, this is a, this is a, um, uh, an issue that, that I talk about a lot with my coaching clients, which is, you know, I I had, I had one client who, um, he was, he was really high up at Amazon. I'm in Seattle. So I have uh, lots of Amazon and Microsoft employees and he was doing so many things well, professionally, you know, he was, um, really highly successful. And at the same time, like his health was failing a bit and he was pre-diabetic and, and on antidepressants and, you know, estranged from his wife and, um, wasn't really talking to his kids. And he was sort of anchoring his, his, this narrative that he built in his mind that this is all for them. Like, why, why are they so mad at me? Like, this mm. is, I'm working hard so I can have, so I can provide them, you know, with the lives that, that, that they want. And, and it takes a lot of courage to slow down and really think about if that's true. Is it, is it true? Is this really all for them? And is there a point of diminishing returns at which you're pushing so hard that it's affecting your spiritual growth? It's affecting your health and your relationships. Your money is good. Your money's good. Your professional trajectory is good. But if it's all these other things are getting in the way and this guy, you know, tons of resources, tons of options, corporate coaches. But um, when he's really slowed down, and took an assessment of why he was doing what he was doing, what this was really for. And it allowed him to sort of reassess the, the plan that he had been hammering on for 20 years. And, you know, the same thing goes for, for so many of us is you have to, you have to really ask yourself hard questions or hire a coach that will, that will help you ask yourself those questions so that you can understand uh, yourself in a deeper level and make the positive adjustments. Maybe it's just taking more vacation. Maybe it's dialing your dialing in your sleep. Maybe it's writing that book that you told yourself that you were going to write 10 years ago and you haven't even started. So it's, it, you, you got to pump the brakes We're we're super <laughs> do, dopamine, acetylcholine. So talk about neurotransmitters, dopamine, acetylcholine. Uh, a lot of us are dominant in those, those two traits and GABA and serotonin, um, a lot of us are deficient in for, for like type A go-getter and, and it's, it's essential for us to have that sort of wellness and, and anchor to, um, like a mission that we, that we create for ourselves. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> very well said. And, um, I'm reminded of a quote that, uh, Dave Rossi shared, I, I think on our interview, maybe it was off, off camera since we, he talks so much, but, um, he said, you know, basically everything we're doing is in pursuit of some kind of hormonal experience. And so 
we're very familiar with the dopamine triggers. Uh, Dr. Robert Lustig wrote that great book, The Hacking of the American Mind. And mm. I think he listed 10 different ones that are just overwhelmed society and turned us into dopamine addicts uh, at the expense of and, and flooding the pathways such that we're not, uh, you know, adapted to, uh, you know, do these serotonin promoting activities, oxytocin, you know, long term satisfaction of a richly lived life instead of just going for the instant trigger. Um, sugar is his main area of focus in life, but he also goes down the list of like excessive exercise, uh, pursuing, you know, competitive success, like at Amazon and seeing your stock go up and, uh, engaging with, um, the one, two punch of, uh, video games and porn for the young American male satisfies their main dopamine drives that, you know, by bi their biological drives to the great detriment of their, uh, their journey through real life because they have all their needs met in the comfort of their bedroom. Yeah. And it was a pretty heavy, uh, reflection to think that, you know, everything we're doing has some form of drive and motivation. And we have a, a great ability now for the first time in history to be constantly entertained by a mobile device or by a digital device to the extent that we don't have the four hour meandering conversations at the coffee house or, you know, the, the time that we engage with nature uh, that we might have when we were little kids uh, in, in our old days or uh, whatever happened, you know, generations ago. Now it's just like, go, go, go all the time. Pump yeah. the brakes, man. That I might have to title the show Sean McCormick Pump the Brakes. I, I love it. That's a great yeah. that's a great uh, takeaway. If you're gonna take one pull quote away, people, pump the freaking brakes. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So that was a great uh transition to your coaching uh operation. And I really wanted to focus on that because if you look on your website, it's one of the most beautiful uh, presentations and the very careful languaging that you share to uh, acquaint the person with what your coaching services are all about and the engagement of, you know, getting pretty deep, asking the penetrating questions, challenging the client to really uh, look deeper than the guy's pop off. I love that pop off line. It's for, it, it's for, it's, I'm doing it for them. What's their freaking yeah. problem? Yeah. yeah. So um, let's let's get further into uh, some of the things you like to do with people to kind of expose, peel the onion. Uh, you talked about NLP, which is great of great interest to me, and I think we can go into a lot of different directions there. Yeah, yeah. The what I've what I've found is I I'm, I don't know. Um, part of me is sort of averse to frameworks. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it helps people understand um, important information and, and follow a plan. And, um, and at the same time, uh, it, it, what, what makes a good, effective coach, life coach. And, would you, and, and so I, I coach people in, in basically four different categories. One is classic personal development. So that's goal setting mentality. Um, that's neuro-linguistic programming, that is, uh, you know, the classic, you think of like Tony Robbins style coaching to like make, make progress in your life. Go do, go, go do the thing that you, that you want to go do. Yeah. Write your book. Finally, quit making excuses. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Personal yeah. development. Okay. Right. The second category is biohacking and the biohacking, as you know, is, um, is, is an important element of, so that we are able to perform at a high level. And I use the term biohacking as, as what, what goes in you, what goes on you and what goes around you. Mm. So how, how can you, how can you come to terms to control those three variables so that you can, um, sleep better, uh, so that you can digest better so that you can, um, uh, exert better. And, uh, there's a, I mean, that will hold the whole bait. Most of the podcast is really focused on, you know, the 307 episodes are, are really kind of focused on, on that area. And the third area is professional development. You know, you have to have money to do the things that you want to do. And, um, most folks kind of feel stuck with where they're at professionally. And there are many different things that you can do really quickly to help move the needle, whether that's to get more money in the position that you're in or to advance yourself into a, into a, into a higher position that you're in or cut bait and go find another career. Uh, and then the fourth category is spiritual development. And the way in my, my approach to spiritual development is, is non-denominational. So whether you are, um, uh, agnostic, uh, Muslim, 
uh, Jewish, Christian, whatever your thing is, um, there is a way to connect deeper to that reality. There is a way, there are inroads, there are things that you can do, um, whether it be the use of the tarot or through meditation or through psychedelic practices to actually make some inroads to develop a deeper sense of your, your spirit, your soul to, to connect. Um, you came from somewhere and you're going to go somewhere um, before and after your life. And, and to come to terms with that fact is, is something that a lot of people kind of kick down the road. They kick that can and they kick that can and they kick that can, and then they get nervous about it later in life. Um, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then they go, Oh shit. What was I ignoring? Yeah. Right. Right. They, they, it's, it's something that when, when you can develop a practice around it to deepen your experience, um, it, it, it improves all the different aspects of your life. So those, those are kind of, those are the four categories that I, that I really work with people in. And my approach uh, is, is unlike a lot of other life coach and performance coaches, because uh, the, the, the lack of a framework, I'm not going to put anybody into a, okay, this is your protocol. You got to, you got to read these books and do this breath and eat this food. And um, do these journaling exercises because not everybody's there. Not everybody wants to do all that stuff. So it's really a custom process. Uh, oftentimes it starts with a, with a tool that I call the life positioning system. And so of, of the, as I say, I don't like frameworks, but here's this one framework, but the, uh, the life positioning system is an assessment um, that most of my clients do in the first session or two. And it looks at eight core categories of your life. And those categories are health, family, money, your environment, spiritual development, romance and intimacy, life purpose, and fun and recreation. So once you have um, a, a subjective assessment of those eight categories of your life, then you can begin to think about, okay, well, which of these areas do I want to nourish? Which of, based on the timing of my life, whether I'm, you know, 24 and just jumping into uh, my professional life or I'm 64 and, um, you know, my kids are grown and I have different consideration sets, that is an excellent tool to short, sort of show people to themselves, just hold up a mirror and say, this is where you say that you're at. What would you like to begin working on? Um, uh, from there, it jumps into, you know, a, a lot of folks, especially now, uh, their habits are totally different than they were uh, a year ago. You know, um, because of COVID, we have our, our our sleep habits have changed, our 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 eating habits and our exercise habits, and, and the way that we um, interact with our with our friends and family have changed radically. So, um, what habits are are serving you um, in these categories, and what what habits are not serving you in your cate- in, in in those categories? And then it's little by little. You know, I pay really close attention to the language that people use. Uh, one thing that that is that that everybody should try is count how many times they say "need to" or uh, "should" <laughs> in in an hour or a day. <laughs> right, right. Like, think about how many times in a day you say to yourself, you know, I, I really need to, I really need to go grocery shopping or I, you know, I really need to work out or, Oh, I should, I should call my mom. Um, when you use language like that, you're sort of detaching from your agency. When, when you are saying, Oh, I should, then you're, you're not really taking responsibility for that stuff. And so a simple reframe from, uh, I should work out today, which sounds like a pain in the ass. And you, you feel like, Oh God, now it just, now it's got, now it's baggage, right? Uh, instead of saying I should work out today, you can reframe that. And this is another, you know, NLP technique is to reframe that into a statement, which is it's important for me to work out today. Even that subtle shift, that change in language is it gives you um, agency and responsibility over what you're going to be, what you're going to choose to do during that day. And then it becomes not this thing that, that you are beholden to um, because somebody's going to, you know, if you don't do it, you're going to get in trouble, but rather you're reorienting the way that you decide to live your life. So I, I encourage everybody today for the rest of the day, do it for a week 
and make a little, take a little notepad with you. And every time that you say it out loud or into yourself, I need, or I should just make a little tick mark very quickly within a day or two, you're going to be so aware of your overuse of those terms. You're shooting all over, you're shooting, <laughs> you're shooting all over yourself all day. And, and it's not, and it's not serving you. It's not building you up. It's, it's keeping you down. So that that's, that's another example of, 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 of how I apply these sorts of, these sorts of custom techniques that I've learned over years and years of, of, of experimentation that really sort of break people out of their, their little box that they put themselves in. Yeah. I, I also feel like when you use those terms, it's sort of a way to uh, slough off the responsibility so I really should write my grandmother a letter. She loves receiving letters in the mailbox. Uh, and there goes another day that I didn't write the letter. But at least I care enough to say that I should mm-hmm. write her a letter. And therefore, I can, I can put it off, uh, detaching from my agency uh, of just doing it and uh, quit talking about it and, and, and bullshitting myself and others. I need to get better about my, my budget. I, I, I spend too much on my credit card. Oh, is that so? Okay, interesting. And uh, how about last month? Oh, yeah, I needed to do better last month. Yeah. And we go through uh, our entire life telling that story. And I guess, uh, I don't know, protecting our self-esteem or our self-image because we have all these should statements that would uh, indicate we're a better person and we know it. Mm. Uh, all we have to do is say, should this, should that, should this. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, I, it's a little bit of a form of like self virtue signaling a little bit, you know, <laughs> I, at least I, at least I, at least I've thought about it. For you know? sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 dangerous, and and there th- those these these are really two low hanging fruit examples of a lot of things that we do just automatically. You know, um, Bruce Lipton is a is one of my heroes. I was lucky enough to have him on the podcast, and and we talked a lot about the subconscious mind. Um, you know, the fact that you know ninety seven percent of our of our decisions throughout the day are uh, directed by the subconscious mind. They're, they're these should statements. Well, where's that should coming from? Is it coming from, from you or is it coming from what you grew up, uh, learning, uh, about how to operate in the world that you just sort of absor- absorb during the, when you were in a theta brainwave state from zero to seven years old, when you just sort of learned culture, you learned how adults talk to each other rather than, um, um, being really cognizant of it. And then that stuff, those narratives, those stories, they just keep building and building and building all throughout your life. And so pretty soon you get to a point where you feel like you're not really making any decisions for yourself at all. There's this free will, you know, conversation wrapped into this, like, do we really have free will? But if your subconscious mind is telling you you're not good enough, or this will never work, or, you know, don't take a risk, you know, you need that job because you need the insurance and all these things, these narratives, they just they get bog us down and working with a, with a really skilled life coach that can help you identify those and then either reframe those or purge those through, you know, some other sorts of practices that, uh, that I really like. Uh, listeners have heard me talk about that assertion from Bruce Lipton and he's done great respected scientific work. So it's not just some guy's opinion. Right. He's looking at cellular energy and the, the Petri dish in the lab that, uh, grows mold and stuff because you're, you're t- talking mean to it and all this crazy stuff. But, um, it was hard for me to grasp that concept that we're, you know, 93 to 97% of the time operating from flawed subconscious programming and, uh, Maybe I'm reading the book going, yeah, I'm probably about 60 to 63% because I'm way more woke than, than whoever average <laughs> is talking about. But the way you just described is, is a little bit of distinction there. So um, the, the actions that you're taking, I'm sure you're purely conscious right now and you're walking up the stairs and you're having a conversation or you're, you're folding laundry or whatever, uh, but they're emanating from uh, subconscious programming even though you you're completely clear and focused in what you're doing right now. Uh, but that part that, that starts to make more sense to me. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're choosing to fold the laundry. Um, but the, the, the background, um, narrative that's happening while you're folding laundry <laughs> is, uh, uh what ni- 90% of the same shit that was going through your mind yesterday and 80% of it negative are those stats, right? right? It's some trippy thing like that. 
Yeah. And, and when I first heard that, yeah, the, the, those statistics really blew my mind. And I, and I, I had to think really critically about it. And in, 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 in the episode, when we talked about it, um, it was, it was, it, it's like layers and layers and layers and layers deep, you know, be beyond what your free will is allowing you to do or, or is giving you the, the option to do. Um, underneath all of that, there are, there are these narratives and frameworks that you've built up in your mind, you know, while you're folding your, your, your clothes, you know, you may be thinking about, you know, how much you hate doing this or, or how, how much mm. of a burden this is, or, or you're not folding it correctly, or your clothes aren't very mm. nice. Right. So it's like these onion layers that go deeper and deeper and deeper that are, um, that are, that are really clouding how we see ourselves. And, you know, um, that, that default mode network is real powerful. And if your default mode is, um, um, safe and I need to play it, I need to, you know, stay alive protect and um and you're uncomfortable there and you want to move out of that place then there's things that you can do and a lot of them are done quietly by yourself you know but you just got to have these these techniques you know uh so really the one of the first objectives i imagine is to uh get rid of these self-limiting beliefs that we're walking around largely emanating from a childhood programming so what do we do there, Sean? What's the, yeah. what's the way to attack this this issue? Yeah, so this is one of my most favorite uh, neuro linguistic programming techniques that uh, that I've ever used, and I honestly I, I don't remember where I found it. I, I think that it was it maybe even have been from like an NLP book, uh, Barnes and Noble, one afternoon, and it's called the Stop Method. And the Stop Method um, uses a a pattern interrupt in which um, basically, uh, short circuits, these pathways in the brain, these thought processes in the brain. So this is a way to get rid of a negative emotion forever. And, uh, I use this one, one, before I tell you exactly how this works, um, I'll tell you a story about one of my clients that use this. So he was going through a divorce and, uh, he was in a custody battle with his wife and he had two boys and she cheated on him. And she cheated on him with a coworker and she was really going quickly with this new guy and she was going to like move in with him. And, um, the old version of him, um, he hated her. I mean, he had, he had good reason to be upset. You know, he, he, for all intents and purposes, he, he, he got, he got done dirty. He was so consumed by anger for her that it was consuming him and it was messing with his sleep. It was messing, messing with his health health. It was messing with his relationship with his two boys. And he, through a session that we were having, I, I said, um, he's like, I'm just so angry all the time. And I said, um, okay, well, how is that anger working for you? And he's like, I don't fucking care how it's working. It just, I I'm fucking mad. And I was like, okay, well, you know, when you, when you, uh, let that out, when you express that emotion of anger, you know, your boys see it, you know, when you talk to your mother and you're talking to her, like she's a child, um, they see that that's their mom. And then that makes you look bad. And that doesn't help like that. You, you, we have to do something around this anger. We can be pragmatic. I can help you sort of strategize, um, the custody stuff and, um, getting your life on track and all that, all that good stuff. We can work on that stuff, but the anger is the first thing we have to deal with. So we, use, so we did this technique and it was, it uh, happened over the course of two weeks. Again, I'll tell you exactly how it goes. We worked on this one technique and at the end of two weeks, after he had done this stop method, like religiously, he was all over it. At the end of the two weeks, they met up to do, um, uh, uh to, for his, the, his ex-wife to pass the kids off for him to the, for the weekend, you know, dad, dad got the boys on the weekend and they met up and she, uh, she said, uh, you know, what are you going to do with the boys this weekend? He's like, oh, you know, we're going to go to the zoo. We're going to, you know, we're going to get ready for a barbecue. Um, it's going to be a great weekend. And she's like, um, you seem weird. And he's like, okay. <laughs> he's like, she's like, what's wrong with you? Are you stoned? And he's like, no, I'm not stoned. She's like, if you're high, I, this is totally unacceptable. Like you are too relaxed. This is fucked up. I, I'm going to call your mom and I'm going to tell her that you're smoking weed. He's like, I'm not smoking weed. I'm just not angry. I'm choosing not to be angry anymore. And she's like, what the fuck does that mean? He's like, I'm just, we can figure out our stuff. 
I just want to have a great weekend because she was doing the thing. She was trying to get under his skin. And that was the dynamic that they had. And, and, and after she realized after a few minutes of prodding him and, and, you know, poking the bear, she realized that she couldn't get under his skin. And then she softened and she said, well, um, I hope you guys have a really great weekend. Um, totally diffused the situation. And he came back, he called me right after he's like, my, my boys are in the car. This is going to be a two minute conversation. I just wanted you. I just want to say, thank you. The stop method has helped me like really turn a corner. This is incredible. So here's how this tool works. So what you do, it's, there's four steps to the stop method. Step one is to go there. Step one is to actually feel that emotion of anger. You know, there's there's different psycho uh, um, psychotherapists that, that will agree or disagree on whether or not it's it's healthy to go into that emotional state. But in this framework, this just really works. So you go there. So for him, it was obvious. It was anger. He was angry. He had good reason to be. Uh, so you go there. And then once you can identify that you're actually in that state of consciousness that you want to reprogram, when you want to stop that, um, once you're there, you're like, oh yeah, I definitely feel it. I'm thinking about her and I'm angry. Then you stand up out of your chair and you say, stop out loud. So you change your physical state, change your posture. You stand up, step forward into it. And you say, stop. And then you replace that negative emotion of anger with a more positive emotion. This sounds so simple, but this is, it just works so well. You've interrupted that pattern of anger and then you've replaced it. Now, before you begin the full method, you will have practiced this replacement emotion, this replacement emotion that you prefer to anger. In his case, it was gratitude. Gratitude, lots of science on gratitude, lots of you know studies that show people are happier and live longer and um, healthier. And so he had a couple of different anchors that he was um, using to attach to that emotional state of gratitude. The fact that my kids are healthy was, was his number one. My boys are healthy. You know, my marriage didn't work out, but my boys are healthy. That was his gratitude anchor. And then once he could get into that state of gratitude, if effectively replaced anger with gratitude, then you have to integrate that somatically by doing some sort of physical motion, some sort of celebratory gesture that signals to your central nervous system that I prefer this better. So for him, this was back when like dabs were cool. So he was, uh, he would, you know, the, you know, you do the dab. Mm. So that was his, that was his celebratory. Like, you know, people, some people do fist pumps, some people do burpees, but you signal to yourself, central nervous system. Like I like this better. And then you start again, you sit down, you go into that negative state of emotion for him was anger. You, when it's there again, you say, you stand up and say, stop, you replace it with gratitude. You do the celebration, that somatic work. And then you sit back down, you do it over and over and over and over and over 20 times a day. Now, building up to this, you have to practice that, that positive emotional state. That's really key because you have to pull it up really quickly. Also, you have to practice without that pressure of the actual meeting with the, uh, the, the ex-wife that you're in dispute with. Right. You exactly. practice in your bedroom before bed or first thing in the morning. Got you. Yes. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's you're yeah, you're not confronted with it. It's not, you know, it's not right in front of your face, but you can, you can, you can get yourself into a place of gratitude and feel it somewhere in your body. For him, it was like in his chest. It was like, that's where he felt it. And what happens is after, if you're really diligent about it, you do it, you know, you do um, a set of 20 and you, you do 20 of those uh, reps and you do that like seven times a day you're gonna get a lot i mean you're 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 also looking you know a little cuckoo because you're talking to yourself and set, getting up and down out of your chair so you've got to do it privately of course and what happens is after a couple of days you get to a point where you don't even you can't even feel that negative thought you can't even feel that emotion it's like i don't even i don't even remember what that feels like like it's hard to get into that negative state. And that's when you have to just keep going. You have to try really hard to really get to the bottom of it, to really identify it so that you can rework that narrative, that emotional state. And you do it over and over. By day six or seven, it's it's really tough. And it, and it, it, it lengthens the, the, the time that you actually do this exercise because 
you have to like find where that anger is. You have to seek it out. Like, Oh, what is that? I can't remember. Like, Oh, I can think of one thing that she said, ah, that doesn't really bug me. Eh, go a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. So you're actually doing this heavy lifting. You're digging into this emotion at its depths. So it's getting deeper and deeper and more wounded and more wounded until you can get, get really to the very bottom of it to get like, okay, I'm angry again and then stop and do it again. So it was two weeks that he had been on this, on the stop method. And that's when he saw, saw his ex-wife and his kids again. And, um, he, he launched from there. I mean, that, that one thing, that one exercise totally launched his life in a completely different direction. And like, he was happier with himself. So like, though, that's just one really powerful example of a technique that's, that's worked for clients of mine. I've used it on myself and that I've seen work time and time again. Oh man, I love it. And I'm, I'm thinking that this can apply to anything, uh, maybe something less extreme than a flaming dispute that's a custody battle with kids. I mean, that's pretty high on the scale of gnarly, but what if you feel stressed about uh, your, your, your bills uh, in the coming month and you go into that mode of uh, fear and anxiety uh, you could work on it in, in all different directions or w- whatever. Maybe it's your, you're having trouble adhering to your diet and you're feeling like a failure. Uh, so you can just plug this stop method into, I guess, any area of life really. Yeah, you really can. And, and the key, the key point is, you know, that the, the fear and anxiety of not being able to able to pay bills is, 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 um, keeping you focused, right? That's like the butterflies before a race, right? It's like, oh, I'm feeling this nervousness. That's that's signaling to me that this is important. I need to really kind of get this thing dialed mm. in. Same thing that that, you know, when you're sitting down to pay bills and it's and it's really, really challenging for you. Um, but th- if that fear and anxiety is taking over and is clouding your judgment, then that's then it's no longer serving you. It's not doing its, it's not doing its um its desired effect. Um, and that, that plan around the bills and the anxiousness around not being able to pay them also has to come with a plan, the plan around how you can better your environment, how you can better your situation, you know, whether it's a side hustle or changing careers or whatever, like there's, there's life strategy that needs to come along with being pragmatic so that that issue doesn't keep coming up. But if, if you are just totally overwhelmed by this emotional state and it's tough for you to do anything else other than, you know, freak out over and over and over again, then yeah, you can, you can use it just about anywhere. Uh, I like that pairing of the strategy with redirecting to something that's uh, productive. And so that in the case of the, 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 the spouse that was angry, um, he's going into a feeling of gratitude. Hey, this is the, the mom. I'm glad she birthed my boys. We can certainly agree on that if we disagree on everything else. Um, but then you have to plug in a different example, such as the person stressed about the budget can go and uh, do their exercises, such as uh, reviewing their spreadsheet with more scrutiny or, or whatever they, uh, wherever they're falling short. So we really have to zero in and identify what, what we need to do to get back on track. Same with the, the, the failed dieter uh, can wake up the next day and uh, you know f- f- skip breakfast, and then they're they're kind of back on track, and they have a miniature success and something they can hold their hat on. Exactly, yeah, you know, ex- exactly. You you can you can make adjustments, you can make improvements, and if the emotions are getting in the way, you can use it for for anything. But then it has to be followed up by some sort of action that actually corrects course. Yeah. Mm, so you're giving permission and you're saying it's okay that these emotions are riling me up because that indicates that it's important to me and that I want to change rather than uh, flagellating myself from the outset because I'm I'm not perfect and I have a negative emotion. Yeah. I mean, you feel, feel those feelings like, you know, it's honor them, recognize mm. them, acknowledge them, thank, thank them for, for being there. Uh, and then if there's a point of diminishing returns with those emotions and they're no longer serving you or helping you in any way, but freaking you out and sending you into a, you know, a sympathetic response and, you know, um, keeping you up at night, then take care of that and then find some action plan to correct course. 
So what happens when you recommend this to your client? You want them to do it several times a day for a week. And we come back with our coaching call a week later. And uh, sorry, sorry, Sean, I, I kind of blew it off. I got really busy and uh, I'm still angry and I can't let it go. What's the intervention at that point when the, the technology is there and it's not being used? Yeah, great question. There, um, there has to be some reason why this has not bubbled up to number one top priority. You know, they're either you're not actually committed to change because a part of you actually is still kind of connected to that emotion. You mm. kind of like feeling you get a angry. payoff of some kind. Yeah, I feel yeah. vindicated when I feel anger for her, or <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I get I, to be right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, she's a you know she's a bitch. So I mean, what are you gonna do? Or you know, um, you know, when it comes to nutrition, you know, you, you're doing it around your, your lifestyle um, and it didn't make its way to top priority. Um, there has to be an, um, some, some reason why, you know, if, if, this is, if you say that this is important to you, if you say that this is really getting in your way of thinking clearly and making strong actions towards the life that you want to create for yourself, then, then it, will, it will get done. If, if it's, if it's of enough importance to you, then it will get done. Now, if it doesn't get done, it's possible that you just don't have the energy to do it. Mm. It's possible that you are gassed out and you are, you've been gassed out because you haven't been sleeping for the last two or three weeks. Well, then we got to figure that out. Uh, it's possible that you're just not very good at structuring the time of your day. And if you can't prioritize, um, you know, four minute chunks of doing this exercise, uh, to, to overcome this debilitating emotional state you don't want. Well, then we need to look at some, you know, the way that you strategize your day. We need to look at your, you know, we need to give you a prioritization tool or, you know, um, uh, this, this is so beautiful because this does, this, <laughs> this does kind of play into a bunch of different stuff that, that I work on people with. Um, you know, if, if you don't have a, a plan of action every day, if you don't have things on the to-do list, you're going to be guessing. You're going to be flying blind just about every day. So we've all got meetings and we've all got, you know, phone calls we have to make and, you know, we've got to show up and turn, flip the laptop up and, and have a conversation with one or more people. We've got to do that. Um, but if you are not sure what to do when that stuff's over and you're just like, uh, guess I'll focus on, hmm. oftentimes you just pick the simplest, easiest, most convenient thing. Mm. You, you you gravitate towards the things that you're familiar with, the things that are easy, that can be done quickly. Oftentimes that's email. <laughs> Oftentimes that's social media. Uh -oh, so that's me raising my hand, man. The email <laughs> yeah. inbox is always awaiting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let me ask you this. Do, do, you, um, do you have like an email strategy? Uh, not a good one. <laughs> okay. I, I, I certainly have the, uh, the, uh, I embrace the suggestion to batch your responses and get your brain in that mode, your reactive mode for an hour and then depart and go into highest cognitive function, peak core responsibilities and highest expression of my talents. And it seems to leak out uh, regularly. And I talk about this a lot of time on the podcast because, uh, you know, here's my show on jumping into the cold freezer or freezing Lake Tahoe in the winter. And I can bet you I'm the only guy on the 72 mile shores of the lake. I'm the only guy swimming in it when it's 42 degrees. So what a badass level 10 badass to go swimming in Lake Tahoe. I usually go to the tourist beach and people are pointing at me and taking pictures like, dude, that's pretty hardcore. I'm like, yeah, thanks. I enjoy it. You know, I'm, I'm patting myself on the back. And so I'm, I'm begging someday, wishing that that will translate over to being the most badass, disciplined email inbox person on the planet. <laughs> and I haven't made that strong connection yet. So uh, this is this is where I sit, man. That's that's your answer. Oh man, that's thank you for thank you for speaking that truth out. That's um, that to our earliest earlier. Oh, it, it's true. I'm the only guy in that lake when it's 42. <laughs> There's no freaking way someone swimming. <laughs> So email batching is, is always, always strongly suggested. Um, uh, another technique, uh, specifically for email, because what email signifies is everybody else's other, everybody else's shit. Mm. It's not my shit. It's everybody else's and everybody else can insert themselves into your day at any given time by sending you an asinine email that wasn't necessary. And 
because you like to please people, because I like to please people. This is something I've had to do a lot of work on. I like to please people. I like to get back to them really quickly. Like within, like within 12 hours is, is kind of where I like to stay. And um, what I've found is this technique where, yes, I do email batch. Um, and also uh, I use this for, and this is, this is for um, highly, um, you know, people who are highly functional, who get a lot of things done is when you're email batching, if there are emails in your email box that you can reply to right away, reply to them right away, low hanging fruit. If it's a mm-hmm. one sentence reply, just get it done. Just get it off your plate. Um, yep. That sounds good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, send me a, send me a calendar invite, you know, boom, that's done. You can do 20 of those in, in a, you know, in a minute mm-hmm. for those other emails that either need more thoughtful consideration and response, or you just don't know yet, or they need to be delegate delegated for other people's input. Um, I'll, I'll open it, I'll read it, and then I'll leave it as unread. So I'll leave it as unread. So I know that I've got to go back to that email, like either in, in 10 more minutes or in the second email batch portion of the day. So I'll go back to it for things that are not passing my sort of, this is important meter. And, you know, there's a number of those things that I, that I, I want to respond. I, I, I'd like to respond and, um, I don't want to spend a bunch of time on it. Oftentimes I'll just email back and say, Hey, just wanted you to know that I saw this email. I appreciate it. And, um, if Mm. you don't hear back from me in three days, email me again to remind me. So you're kind of giving that back to them. (laughs) Yeah. Right. It's not on you anymore. You've acknowledged you got the email. You don't want to leave it unread. You want to honor that with a, with a, with a quick response to acknowledge it. Then you say, Hey, this, this needs some additional thought from me. Um, I just, I need an, an additional time. Get back to me in three days. If I don't, if I don't reply, just, just send me another email. Cause then that way, the people who are, uh, if, if, if it's not that important, they won't email back. Um, if it is that important, then they will email back. And oftentimes their second email is shorter and more to the point. So it wastes less of your time, burns less of your important calories coming out of your brain. So then you can be faster. So then this four paragraph email that you skimmed and said, Hey, this is cool. Get, let, get back to me in three days. If I don't email back, the next email is now three sentences with an ask. And I can say, okay, yes or no. And then I reply back. So for me, that that's really worked. And it's also worked for a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, high level clients, people who are, you know, super productive and on top of their, on top of their stuff. So um, I don't know, hope, hopefully that helps, but th- those, those sorts of distractions will always be there. They will always come into our lives. And if that's keeping you from moving forward in your life, the, the little minutia of the day that will always be there little note push notifications and emails and stuff like that um, is to get as, as fast with those as possible so that you can, like you said, focus on the stuff that you're really good at and that the stuff that you love to do. I love it. Yeah. I think um, I'm also acknowledging that dopamine hit that comes from uh, launching into the inbox and getting all this uh, fresh uh, variable stimulus to the brain. And it's more exciting than having to grind to finish another chapter of a book. And so, you know, the high cognitive demand tasks tend to get pushed aside, even though they should be the first priority first thing in the morning when we're the most right. fresh. So um, I think, you know, more acknowledgement and then taking those taking those baby steps. And I think that's what's good about your advice is like, uh, you know, the 60 second rule, I guess, if you can answer or take care of something around the home, like sort out the junk mail from the regular mail, you do that right away every time because it only takes a minute. And then opening the mail and, and considering it is something that you set aside to do when uh, you have the, you know, more time and energy to devote. So yeah, uh, good stuff, man. Okay, I'm, I'm on it. I'm making <laughs> a commitment to Sean and all listeners that we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna up, up the priority here. Nice. Good. 
so I'm going to let you go and you've got probably people lining up for your, your coaching services and you can plug those at the end. But I am also curious since you are really big into that, uh, so-called biohacking space and the, the physical optimization in the environment, uh, you said, uh, in, around you, on you, in you, all those kind of things. Um, maybe you can share some of your favorites that have really been fun and exciting and worked well for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh man, there's so many that I love. Um, for me, the, the two most useful biohacking tools that I've ever come across are blue blocking glasses, uh, that I wear every single night and oftentimes during the day. Um, uh, just a short one on that. I mean, does your, does your audience know much about blue blocking glasses? Am I going to be being a dead horse? If I, explain uh, it? I don't think we've had dedicated shows to it. And I think it's definitely out there and people are curious and, uh, participating at various levels of commitment. So I'd love to know more. Yeah. Yeah. So the long and short of it is when you stay up at night after the sun has gone down and you're looking at screens, the blue light that's coming from these screens and uh, blue and green is signaling through your eyes that it's daytime. So you're, you're, the sun has gone down and your circadian rhythm should be beginning to wind down, lowering the lights in your house, um, switch. The, this is counter to what most people think and what we've been told. I don't have any LED lights in my house anymore. I switched all back to incandescent because I can, I'm sensitive to that flicker that comes from LED lights. Um, right. I don't think that's widely known. So just briefly, yeah. uh, the LED, which is taking over the, the lighting industry, I guess, because they're cheaper, or they last longer, whatever. But at a microscopic, uh, imperceptible level, they're flickering like crazy. And yeah. your brain knows, even if you can't identify it from staring at it, right? Right, right. So that feeling that you get when you walk into like an office building or a dentist office, and it's those super bright, like white lights that are, you know, nine feet above your head. Those are terrible for you. They're terrible for your central nervous system. They're terrible for your eyes. Uh, there's, there's science that now shows that you have light receptors on your skin. So if you're wearing a t-shirt in your house at night and you have your lights on and they're LEDs, we've, you know, we, uh, a couple of years ago, they rolled back the LED requirements. So now you can actually have incandescent in your house. They are a little bit more money. They are a little less uh, energy efficient. And I, I like to think that, you know, that my lifestyle is, is doing some other things to help benefit the planet in, in other ways, you know, chickens in a garden and composting and recycling and all that stuff. But um, positive point score. Yeah. yeah. Try, I'm trying, man. I'm yeah. trying. You know, uh, so th you're at nighttime when you're surrounded by LED lights that are, that are literally flickering, they flicker on and off at a really, uh, at a really high pace that you can't even see. Your brain notices that. And different people have, different sensitivities to that, but we've all felt that feeling where you walk into an office building and the lighting is terrible and just feels like a, like it's draining your soul. Um, that that's, that's bad for you. <laughs> that's bad for you. Um, combined with light exposure after dark, uh, for me, I'm in Seattle. So, um, you know, sunset now is, is like five o'clock. So it's still, it's still fairly early. It's going to get up to like nine or so in, in the summertime. Um, for a while, it was like 4.30, you know, 4, 4.30 sundown. So um, if you're watching TV and, or screens or laptops or your phones, uh, and even if you use the filter on there, the little night filter that makes it a little bit more yellow, it's still doing the same thing. That's not helping at all. Mm. There are, there's, there's studies that show that that doesn't actually help whatsoever. Um, blue blocking glasses. Um, my, my favorite are blue blocks. They are, they're stylish. They're really high quality. And when you wear those, you're, it's blocking out that blue light that's coming into your brain. And so therefore your brain is able to cr start creating melatonin later, um, endogenous melatonin that you need to get into phase two and phase three sleep into REM sleep. So when you wear your blue blocking glasses at night, you can still look at screens if you wish, and you're not suppressing that melatonin production and you are beginning to establish a, a circadian rhythm that is more appropriate to the area of geography that you live. So there are two types mm. of two types, really there's, there's like the, um, the exogenous circadian rhythm, and then there's an endogenous. So we all have different sleep cycles and types and stuff like that. So for me, blue blocking glasses have been an absolute game changer. Um, the second 
my, my second most favorite is the X3 bar. Uh, wow. I, I realized a long time ago and I've done, you know, I've got grounding mats and plasma generators and biosignatures, which is this really incredible um, um, energy um, energy purification system that for your household um, and for your body. Um, if you want to have a really great episode uh, about um, healing through shape, uh, Dariah Kareem, uh, K-A-R-I-M from Biosignatures. She's an amazing, brilliant woman. Her and her father have developed this, this um, technology. But for me, I want to, I want to, I don't, I want to work out. I want to gain muscle in the shortest amount of time possible. And I realized that that X3 and one gram of protein per pound of body weight was like the thing I was missing to really change my physique. You know, I was a a uh, college athlete, college scholarship soccer player. And I wow. played in the Oly- Olympic development program growing up and I've, you know, played in leagues and done jujitsu since then. And I've never had the body that I thought I could really have. And, and X3 and literally in 10 minutes a day has just totally changed my physique for the better. So those, those are my top two. Um, there are a lot of environmental factors to consider. If you're not turning off your Wi-Fi when you go to sleep at night, start doing that. You will be amazed how your sleep improves, how the quality of, and the depth of your sleep improves. If you turn off your Wi-Fi when you go to sleep at night, or I just have it on a lamp timer if you want. Um, but these are all things that are part of uh, things you can control that will help you be your best so that you can be at a baseline to make bigger decisions about the life that you want to lead and the relationships that you want to nourish and the, 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 the vision that you have for your life. So you got to kind of take care, take care of the physical stuff. And so that you can continue to grow beyond it. Love it, man. Those are two distinct and, you know, random biohacks, but fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel the same about the variable resistance training that's promoted by Dr. Jayquish and the X3 bar. And of course, you can also do any uh, resistance tubing or uh, like I use stretch cords. I've used them for 20 years, the, the stuff the swimmers use. Uh, but, you know, particularly uh, the, the X3 allowing you to get this total body workout in such a short time. It's hard for people to imagine. Uh, and, you know, you hear a lot of scoffing and, and detractors saying, oh, 10 minutes a day, come on, that's ridiculous. But um, the only critique I have of it is that I actually was dabbling in it a little bit too much because I yeah. love my micro workouts and I really fried my muscles because uh-huh. the workout is so tremendous and it stimulates the muscle to a level far beyond a standard weight training where you're pushing around heavy weights and uh, constrained by your uh, weakest point of force production uh, with the heavy weight. But, oh yeah, so yeah, this guy yeah. is on the ball, people. I've been tweaking with that a little bit. Um, I don't know, if do you, do you experiment at all with um, blood flow restriction? Uh, no, but I've heard about it and it sounds pretty interesting. This is, so, uh, describe a little bit what that is. Yeah. So, so blood flow, blood flow restriction training is, is restricting blood flow to your, uh, to your limbs, um, because then it increases white blood cells. It, it, uh, it makes your body work harder. So you get to fatigue faster and, um, it doesn't occlude the blood. It's not like a blood pressure cuff where it stops blood flow. It's not like a, a, like a, like a strap that has no give where it's like cutting off blood flow but it restricts it to a, to a, to a large extent. And, uh, Dr. Jim Stray Gunderson, I've had him on the podcast. He's the creator of B strong bands, which is, um, uh, if, based on what I can tell the highest quality blood flow restriction, but you, you basically put a, put a cuff, um, just underneath your shoulder above your bicep on both arms. And then you put cuffs, um, at the highest point, you know, um, on your upper thighs, you know, just below the butt and you pump them up until it's, you know, it's tight it's, it's, it's pretty tight. And then you just go about your workout. Now there's great studies around, uh, the, the origin, the original is, is called Katsu. <coughs> Katsu is kind of the, the origin of BFR. And, um, they did it with Japanese populations. It started with Japanese bodybuilders and they started experimenting with elderly populations and the elderly can get really good exercise. Like, <laughs> like really good deep exercise with very little time and very little um, um, exertion because when you are 
um, doing light workouts with these bands on, you're getting the benefits of, of a longer term, high intensity training session. And the science is, the science is amazing. So, so to your point with that, with the X3, I'll do a BF, I'll, I'll put the BFR cuffs on, but then I'll do three sets of 30 with the white band or the, or the mm. light gray band. So I won't mm. go to the variable resistance. I won't do the full exertion at, at, at full range, middle range and, and uh, mini range. So I'll do three sets of 30. And I find that that, um, it does a little bit of a different thing and, and, and works, works well too. Optimal performance, people. Thank you so much, Sean McCormick. Definitely go check out his podcast and uh, tell us where we can learn more about your coaching services beyond listening to Optimal Performance Podcast. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, uh, Brad. I I, uh, I really like your style, man. I like your enthusiasm. I like your I like your attitude to the work that you do. Your podcast is wonderful. Your guests are great. Uh, I'm not just saying that because I'm a guest now, um, but I, I like, I, I, it's I'm the really greatest pretty... lineup of guests we've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. It just keeps getting better and better. <laughs> uh, yeah. You can find me. Um, yeah. It's the optimal performance podcast. And then you can find my coaching site is my name. It's Sean McCormick, S E A N uh, M C C O R M I C K.com. Sean McCormick.com. And then uh, on Instagram, it's real Sean McCormick. And really active there. That's where I'm the most active. Um, and I love talking with people. So if anybody has feedback or questions or wants to call BS on anything I've said, like, let me know. Bring it on. Bring it on. Thanks everybody for listening. Great show. Da, 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 da.